In the modern tree of life, I, I mentioned that we would come back to this idea of domains because an emerging sort of popular classification system instead of kingdoms is to divide life into three major groups. And these three major groups are called the archaea, the ancient microbes, the bacteria, who are also old but they have a different kind of cell structure than the archaea, and the eukarya, which are the more modern organisms, modern being about one and a half billion years old as opposed to the three and a half billion years old that's uh, thought to be the age of the first life of the archaea and the bacteria. So these three major groups make up all of life on Earth. And we're going to take a little closer look at each one of these major groups because all of them are found in the ocean and all of them are important. And one of the things I like about the domain system of life is that it elevates archaea to a separate sort of category and the archaea are turning out to be extremely important in the world ocean. They're an area of active study. We're finding them in places that we didn't even know that they exist and they're really fascinating organisms We've only known about them for maybe a little over 20, 30 years or so. Here's what it looks like when we create a phylogenetic tree based on the genetic relationships between organisms. And here's how the three groups look. We have the bacteria in one group, the archaea in another group, and the eukarya in another group. This is what we call the modern tree of life that's figure 12.5 in your book. And it's based on genetic similarity. And we're not going to go into the details of how that's figured out, but you just have to trust that scientists have figured this out. The bacteria are united by certain type of genetic codes. We also find that bacteria have what we call a prokaryotic cell structure. That means that they lack the kinds of internal organelles that our cells do. Um, they have, I don't want to call it unorganized, but it's not an apparent organization. And bacteria also have a very unique cell wall compared to the other two groups. The archaea, or the ancient bacteria, we once could say these were the extreme bacteria because we find them in hot pools, like the pools that we see in Yellowstone would be filled with Thermococcus or Thermoproteus, these sort of organisms, single-celled, that can tolerate very hot temperatures. We also find archaea on hydrothermal vents. Archaea are also found in salt, almost pure salt. So the salt flats you might see if you were driving somewhere in California um, out towards Mammoth Lakes or around San Francisco Bay Area and saw salt flats, you might see a pinkish tinge to those salt flats. Well, those are archaea, namely halophiles, that are living within those salts. They can tolerate that very high saline environment. We also find archaea living in swamp gas and methane-rich uh, environments. And again, what we originally thought of the archaea, these are bacteria that live and survive in very extreme environments. And it was for that reason that they're also thought to be extremely ancient because life on Earth would have been very rugged three and a half billion years ago because Earth was still being bombarded by meteorites. It was still hot and molten. It really wasn't a very nice place to live, but somehow these organisms found a way to eke out a living on, on that type of planet. What we've now found, though, with the archaea is that they also can be found throughout the ocean at, in waters that are really from average temperatures of waters. We call them low temperature bacteria, but in fact we find archaea throughout the ocean, throughout the world ocean. So it kind of dispels the notion that they're just extreme environment organisms. It means that we can also find these very unique organisms just about anywhere uh, on Earth, at least in the ocean and in these extreme environments on land. The final domain is the one that we live in, the eukarya. And eukaryotes are characterized by cells that have organized cell structures, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But look here. We, in this group called animals, are very closely related to plants, single-celled eukaryotes like ciliates and flagellates, and ciliates and flagellates make up a large part of the microzooplankton that we'll get to in a few chapters from now. But again, all of these organisms in this group in eukarya 
have a very specific cell type and they also have genetic material that's more similar to each other than any of these other two groups. So again, we can divide life on Earth into these three major groupings, what we call domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. If we take a kind of closer look at each one of these groups, as I mentioned before, the archaea are composed of two different types, the extreme temperature forms, what we call the Uri archaeota, and the low temperature forms, the Kren archaeota. Now, I'm not going to make you remember Uri archaeota and Kren archaeota because, well, they're just too hard to remember and it's not really, the name isn't so important to us, but as long as you have some sense of where, ar where archaea occur and why they're important, that's the key to understanding, uh, that's the key to this particular group. The bacteria themselves are even a little bit more complicated. We have at least 18 major marine groups, anywhere from the cyanobacteria, which are the dominant photoautotroph. That means cyanobacteria are the main organism that are, uh, that are doing photosynthesis in the ocean. They're the organism that are responsible for most of the oxygen that comes out of the ocean, anywhere from 50 to maybe 70% of the oxygen and the productivity, the primary pro productivity of the ocean comes from the cyanobacteria, something that has only been appreciated really in the last 10 to 20 years or so. Bacteria. We also know that bacteria are really everywhere and the bacteria, the, their importance cannot be underestimated not only in the world ocean but in terrestrial biosphere as well. Recently, this bacteria, originally called SAR-11, now it's called Pelagibacter ubique, was found everywhere. We now know that it might be the most abundant microbe in the world ocean. Just discovered the most abundant microbe in the world ocean. It just tells you there's a lot we don't know about the ocean yet. The eukarya, to which we belong, consists of at least 26 different groups or phyla, although there's still some controversy over how we're going to how we classify the single-celled eukarya but the main ones that we want to know and really ones that I think you should be familiar with because they again enhance your appreciation of organisms on the seashore that would be the sponges which belong to the phylum periphera the corals and jellyfishes which belong to the phylum cnidaria the segmented worms just like the earthworms, only these ones are in the ocean, the annelida, clams and squids, which some of you like to eat, belong to the phylum mollusca, along with seashells, shrimps and crabs belong to the same phylum as the insects, the arthropoda, sea stars and sea urchins, which many of us know, one that we like to take a look at and we're happy to find, the other one that we like to avoid because we don't want to get uh, stuck by one of its spines, they belong to the spiny skin phylum, or the Echinodermata, and of course the fishes and whales, which belong to the phylum Chordata.